tonight. Mugabe's opposition, the Senate Guide to Surviving Sex Scandals, and SNL's new era of diversity. Eight women have accused Charlie Rose of sexual harassment, alleging that the television host exposed himself, made lewd phone calls, and groped them in incidents spanning from the 1990s up to 2011. Rose told the Washington Post, quote, I have behaved insensitively at times, and I accept responsibility for that, though I do not believe that all of these allegations are accurate. Rose was immediately suspended by CBS, and PBS says they've halted production of The Charlie Rose Show. Earlier today, Glenn Thrush, White House reporter for The New York Times, was suspended from the paper after four female journalists accused him of inappropriate sexual behavior. In a statement, Thrush said, I apologize to any woman who felt uncomfortable in my presence and for any situation where I behaved inappropriately. Nebraska has approved a route for the controversial Keystone XL pipeline. The state's Public Service Commission greenlit the use of one of three routes proposed, but affected landowners have yet to be contacted and could present new legal challenges. Just last week, another section of the pipeline spilled more than 200,000 gallons of oil in South Dakota, but Nebraska law states that the commission can't consider pipeline safety in making a decision. The Justice Department filed an antitrust lawsuit today in an attempt to stop AT&T's $85 billion deal to buy Time Warner, which owns HBO and CNN. The suit said the merger would harm consumers and, quote, result in fewer innovative offerings and higher bills for American families. AT&T calls the suit, quote, a radical and inexplicable departure from decades of antitrust precedent. German Chancellor Angela Merkel is facing a political crisis after talks to form a coalition failed last night, but says she would rather risk new elections than rule as a minority government. Merkel's conservative party got just 30% of votes in September elections, forcing her to seek a coalition with the pro-business Free Democratic Party and the Green Party. But the collapse of those negotiations could trigger new elections that could further weaken Merkel and destabilize Europe's largest economy. At a rally in New Delhi, tens of thousands of farmers from all across India demanded help from the government to erase their debts and to establish fair compensation for their crops. Women and men from over a hundred farmers' organizations carried skulls, representing the thousands of farmers who have committed suicide, and they condemned what they call the apathy of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government. Thousands of farmers are here to say the government must intervene to protect our interests. We need a guarantee of minimum income. The Argentine Navy says that the crew of its missing submarine reported a mechanical failure last Wednesday, but insisted the failure had nothing to do with the ARA San Juan's disappearance. The frantic search of an almost 200-mile area off the coast of Patagonia has been complicated by storm conditions and has entered a critical phase as the sub's oxygen supply runs low. Argentina's president visited the naval base where the vessel was supposed to return and met with the crew's families. Zimbabwe's ruling party had demanded that President Robert Mugabe step down by noon today. And the leader who's been in power for 37 years and who's been under military house arrest since last week went right ahead and ignored that deadline. Tomorrow, members of Mugabe's ZANU-PF party are scheduled to launch impeachment proceedings against him. As lawmakers and military brass try to resolve the political turmoil somewhat amicably, Vice News Tonight met with one of Mugabe's most vocal critics. Zimbabwe! Pastor Evans Mawariri's protest videos on YouTube this became hugely popular on social media. They also got him arrested and forced him to flee the country at one point. But now, he's back. Zimbabwe! 
everyone to realize that this is not about one person or one party, it's about everyone. I know that the army is driving it, but can you see we're all here? Even then people think it's the same party, but for the first time, everyone is included, and that's what matters. Thank you. I've always been there. Thank you. And I know you. I know you. Zimbabwe I've had to live in is one way we are not allowed to express our rights. One way we don't have access to basic rights. We don't have clean water. Uh, we don't have health. We don't have jobs. You know, it's a kind of Zimbabwe where people are not allowed to express themselves freely. We want it to go. Let's go. You know, people were asking me, last year when I was a resident this year, and they said, aren't you afraid? You know, and I said, yes, I am afraid, but let me tell you who I'm more afraid of. I'm more afraid of my children 20 years from now. When they ask me, why did you do nothing? That is a more fearful thought. Right now, we are right in the middle of the central business district. Everyone is marching. Uh, we're all going towards State House now, and uh, there is hundreds of thousands of people on the street. Everyone has come from everywhere. We don't have to wait for someone to tell us a victory. Look at it. It's a victory. Mugabe never allowed us to do this. And this time we didn't get his permission. We did it ourselves. He's gone. He's history. We're not sure what the information is. We're told that uh, the general that came out to address has said that he thanks people for coming, that it's the first step and that there'll be more information coming out, so he's asked us to go. Magona, Magona! Let's go, let's go home. This is the end of an era, guys. We have never seen anything like this. I mean, this is just, just incredible. I'm trying to set up my Twitter here at the same time. As the president of Zimbabwe, and as their commander-in-chief, do acknowledge the issues they have drawn my attention. I mean, it was just, it was crazy. Like the whole nation was listening to this thing. And this guy said nothing, nothing. And he was sitting there with the generals and you know, everybody. And when it, when it finished, like the whole nation was just like, what, what just happened? So I think that, you know, for the first time, there is a little bit of, you know, kind of worry that maybe things are not gonna go our way. But, you know, I think the optimism is there because you can see the process already started um, and you know the voices are really loud from all the citizens to say hey look we, we don't want this today a second woman accused Al Franken of misconduct Lindsay Men said the Minnesota senator grabbed her behind in 2010 when he was already in office and they posed for a photo together. Franken said he feels, quote, badly that Ms. Menz came away from our interaction feeling disrespected. Franken still may very well keep his seat in Congress and he wouldn't be the first lawmaker to survive a scandal. There are two main questions people are asking about Senator Franken. Should he stay in the Senate? And can he stay in the Senate? Should is really up to him. Can is an easy one. Yes, 
Franken can stay in the Senate until at least January 2021 when his term expires. That leads us to a much more important third question. What happens to him if he stays? What's life like for a morally compromised senator? In 2004, David Vitter was elected as a Republican senator from Louisiana on a platform of family values conservatism. He made a name for himself as a kind of outsider truth teller type. By the beginnings of the 2008 presidential cycle, he actually was a national figure. Rudy Giuliani made him a co-chair of his campaign that year. Then, in July 2007, Washington was rocked by the DC Madam scandal, in which the phone numbers of men who had used a prostitution service in the city were posted online. Vitter's phone number was one of them. I want to again offer my deep, sincere apologies to all those I have let down and disappointed with these actions from my past. A lot of people called for Vitter to resign for a lot of reasons. Vitter ignored them all. What was left was a senator who could vote on bills, but couldn't talk to reporters. But Vitter had a plan, become indispensable to the ultra-conservative right. He immediately, like the first day, dropped 15, 20, 30 bills into the hopper that were all red meat conservative politics ones, you know, expanding gun rights, ending abortion, uh, you know, just every hot topic. So he very strongly made a case like, hey, this scandal is behind me. It's unimportant. I'm fighting for the things that you believe in. In 2010, Vitter surprised a lot of people by running for re-election. He won by a lot. In his second term, he joined some high-profile bills with Democrats, and he got money for his state. But he couldn't shake the DC madam thing. He never got that 2007 mojo back. Still, Vitter was pretty confident. So he ran for governor in 2015. First his Republican opponents, and then his Democratic opponent, attacked him over the prostitution stuff. Ivid Vitter chose prostitutes over patriots. Vitter found himself having to apologize yet again. 15 years ago, I failed my family, but found forgiveness and love. And this time, the voters weren't feeling it. And Vitter got out of politics after losing that governor's race. Vitter isn't the perfect comparison to Franken by any means. The people I talked to in Louisiana today said Vitter probably could have been re-elected to the Senate as many times as he wanted to had he sought re-election. And it's not clear Franken could win another term at all now. Franken was growing a national profile just like Vitter was when that photo on the plane came out. And like Vitter, he'll probably have to give that national profile up for a while if he wants to try and ride this thing out. Former cult leader Charles Manson died in a California hospital on Sunday. The convicted murderer was serving life in prison for his infamous role in the 1969 slayings of nine people in Los Angeles. Before his death, Vice News spoke with Jeff Gwynn, author of the definitive Manson biography. Charlie Manson will be remembered as the quintessential American boogeyman, an insane monster who had the ability to rise up anywhere and strike at any victim he chose, no matter how famous, no matter how supposedly well protected. That isn't in any way the truth, but the mythology is so strong, I think it's just going to last. Everybody likes that evil character. They created, you know, you know that, that guy with the eyes. You gotta realize, man, all the guys you've been creating now are not really real in real life. Charles Manson should be remembered as a blue-collar thug with no redeeming qualities and as proof that demagogues are the most dangerous facet of any society. What does your Sunday usually look like? 
Um, I would be asleep, so probably. <laughs> if I hadn't invaded yeah, your apartment? Yeah, <laughs> I would still be asleep. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Was there any uh, skits from last night that you really liked? I like the the Casey and JoJo one was fun. Yeah, there was a lot of strong sketches last night, and then the um, the hip hop one was really fun. You had one that you thought you thought was gonna air. I mean, it was close to airing. Yeah, I don't mm -hmm. ever think it's gonna air until it airs. It was close to airing, though. Yeah. Is it frustrating when that doesn't happen? Of course, you spend the whole week writing a thing and working on a thing, and it didn't. No one got to see it. Sam thought? J starts her Sundays a little later these you know, days, now that she's a rookie yeah, writer on SNL. Like, None of her sketches have aired not. yet. She's still getting used to writing for other people. No, be white. Live it up. It's your delusion that bothers everybody. Like, it's not that you gentrify a neighborhood. It's that when you do, you ride around on a unicycle in a gang territory. Sam started her career as a stand-up comedian in Los Angeles, and she's had her own half-hour special on Comedy Central. She's one of seven new writers on SNL. The show, which premiered in 1975, now has one of the most diverse staff in its history. I just want to write the stuff I want to make that kind of like isn't, art, the show's not already servicing. What's that? Like what? You know, urban culture stuff that they may not necessarily have their pulse on. Gay culture stuff that they may not necessarily have their pulse on. Just who I am. You know what I mean? SNL wasn't always the easiest place to talk about this sort of thing. Keenan Thompson's been on the show for 15 seasons, making him the longest running cast member in its history. He remembers when the show was a lot more white. For a long time on the show, you were the only black dude on there. Yeah. I, I How held long it down was this? for like five, six? I held it down for like six seasons. Yeah. Dolo, strong. Strong. Was that mm. tough? It was lonely. Really? Yeah. I, but it, I wouldn't say it was tough. I was Why would just you say it's lonely? Fun. And you know, it's, it's always lonely being the only one of anything. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And like I was still friendly with everybody else. Like nobody made me feel like an outsider or anything. But you do notice. Diversity in the cast, or the lack thereof, has been a topic that's been surrounding SNL for a few years. And in a weird way, Keenan's had a lot to do with that. In 2013, he was quoted as blaming the lack of black women in SNL's cast on a lack of talented black women. Keenan says he was misquoted, but the whole thing put some public pressure on SNL to hire more diverse talent. But even on his own, Keenan's been helping to bring different perspectives to the show. First, there was What Up With That. Let's take a look at our final Jeopardy category. And then Black Jeopardy. Which, in turn, had brought in a lot of viewers who might not have been watching the show before. Well, it was good while it lasted, though. I can say as me, like, when Black Jeopardy came out mm -hmm. and when I'm watching What Up With That, that's when the show really came, I don't want to say came back, but came back for me. Because I was like, oh. It started speaking more directly to you yeah, and the black man. It yeah. did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've always wanted to have a large hand in, in that and, like, representing the community very well mm -hmm. in a way that's, like, yeah, we can do like only black references, but it'll be in a smart way where anybody can kind of get the joke. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like when I felt like I was like, oh, that's a big sketch. Okay. And people just kept coming to me, man, we sing that when we're decorating our Christmas tree. And there'll be like a very suburban white family. It's like, that was the kind of sketches that I go fishing for. That's going to be the test for Sam. Figuring out how to add new cultural perspective into a mainstream show in a way that's funny for everyone. I've read and I've heard you say that you you want to be able to impact culture. Your impact, like, I don't know. It's, it's not like you get up and you're, you get on stage and you're like, I'm about to impact y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm about to change culture. That's what I love about comedy is you're going to be changed no matter what. Period. How do you mean? Meaning you can't unsee things and you can't unhear them. So how do you do that through SNL? How, how do you how do you get those? Nigga, I don't know. <laughs> if I knew, my shit would be on TV. <laughs> That's Vice News Tonight for Monday, November 20th. 